Hi everyone, I'm Nathan. I am um, here, so I'm trying to jet lag coming from San Francisco. Right now it's like 5 a.m., so we're gonna see how this goes. But yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, super happy to be here. Um, I work at a company called Gusto, based in San Francisco. Uh, we are a company that is a people platform for uh, payroll benefits and more. So I was the first application security engineer um, at Gusto. And then for actually a, a moment as well, I was the only member of the security team. A lot of my coworkers and friends thought that it was super cool that I was the only person on the security team. They thought I had a ton of power and that I could do whatever I wanted. Spoiler alert, had no power and couldn't do anything. Naturally, they were also curious to see what my day-to-day -day entailed, what responsibilities I had, what I had to do, again, as the only member on the security team. So after giving them a rundown of what my day-to-day -day entailed, then they actually realized how much work is really involved and how it is just a ton of responsibility to secure a company basically by yourself. Um, as a individual contributor with effectively no power. So now I want to take a step back and kind of talk about what was up against me and what I was facing. So here as this picture shows, I was quite in over my head. I had a lot of things not in my favor. So first off, I was outnumbered by the engineers one to a big number. I think it was like 100 or 150. So you can imagine how much code they were pushing out every single day. Just myself there. I worked, or working at a startup. And for those of you who are startup, you know that there are ever-changing priorities with management wanting this one day and then kind of shifting to a whole different thing the next day. And then you can imagine what that entails again for security. A lot of different new risks popping up from these new ventures. And then finally, again, I was an individual contributor. So I was not a CISO. I was not a director of security. I was just an IC on the security team tasked with leading security effectively for Gusto. So the fixed input was my time. I only had a certain number of hours per day, and I loved to sleep. So in order to balance sleep, but also trying to run security, I had to somehow find a way to amplify myself across the whole company for engineers and non-engineers alike. Now I want to go over a few of the technical strategies that I used, again, to um, maximize my output given the limited time input. So given this input, what can I do to make myself present across nearly the whole company? I think a lot of you here in this room are very familiar with the idea of shifting left, right? So. This is not a new concept, but I think I want to emphasize how much Im more important it is given the position I was in to shift, or even there's a newer term called push left, which is pushing security at the forefront, not just shifting it, is the more forceful action. So one thing that does scale really well is software. Being able, there we go. <laughs> Being able to write code is incredibly powerful. Um, not sure if anyone has seen Dino Daisovi's Black Hat keynote this uh, past summer, but it was an incredible presentation where he talked about 
how modern day security teams are most effective when their engineers are able to write code. And I think as a former software engineer, I would fully agree, quite biased, but being able to write code and being able to speak the language to the engineers and what they use every day is so, so powerful. I think one thing um, which was not realized is that you gain a lot of inherent respect from the engineers by being able to build the features for them or to push out pull requests for bugs that come in through either a pen test report or a bug bounty. So by being able to show them that you could effectively hang with them, that you can write code, you will gain their trust and then you can trust them as well and it goes both ways. In also continuing along the same idea, it's important to automate anything that's repeatable and deterministic. So one tool that we use uh, at Gusto is called Danger. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has used it, but it's a fantastic tool to allow myself to scale by being able to keep eyes on different things. So one example here is that we use a tool called Breakman Static Code Analysis uh, internally at Gusto. So we have a list of exceptions, which are false positives that are thrown by the tool. And if an engineer tries to be sneaky and tries to throw one in, it's going to ping me um, from the GitHub pull requests. Again, this means that I myself don't have to go through every single pull request that comes through. Again, you can imagine how many pull requests are coming in every hour, every day. So with my limited time, I can use software that's more powerful than I will ever be to keep an eye out for me. And that's a great segue to my next topic, is static code analysis. Um, very much in the same way, people have already written tools to do what I would try to do, but would be slower and would be less reliable. So if we're looking for a SQL injection or we're looking for an XSS vulnerability, I myself don't have to go through every single pull request. I can put this at the very forefront of the development process for the engineers and they can have instant feedback. I think that's one thing that is that might be overlooked by some of us in security is how important instant feedback is for the developers. Again, coming from the software engineering background, being able to instantly see how secure my pull request is, if there's some error. This means that the engineers aren't blocked by my time and that they're able to proceed along by writing code as fast as they're able to. And then the next thing that was super helpful in this process was using software and tools for vulnerable dependency management. So again, a lot of companies use open source tools as part of their application. That's great for saving time, but also it means that you open up a lot of different vulnerability or chances for a vulnerability given the open source software that you're effectively trusting as part of your system. So I could go through every single gem file or package.json and keep an eye on all the dependencies, but that would take forever and there's no way that I have this much time in the world to look over it, to cross-reference what CVEs were released yesterday. So by using this tool to automate, to check, and to update packages, this saves an incredible amount of time. So I think one thing here is a common theme among writing code, doing static code analysis, and doing automatic uh, vulnerable dependency management is that this is all um, doable because of software. So 
in order to amplify myself given the limited time and to have the broadest reach, software was absolutely an incredible tool in my arsenal to allow me to scale myself. And then like one more point on that as well, again, is that I didn't need any power. I didn't need a heavy hammer for this. It's because through this software, it's very black and white. It shows the developers your code either is secure or isn't secure. So I don't have to deal with any of the things that could come associated with trying to force someone to do it. The evidence is right there. If there's a SQL injection, the tool will show you, and you have to fix it. And now, kind of moving a little further right, is pen testing. So this is not necessarily part of the process. This would occur after the products have already shipped and are launched. Um, but one thing that is really helpful with this also, hopefully that you all already are doing this um, as part of an annual or even more frequent basis is that you have a set of experts going super deep into your code, looking for vulnerabilities with the source code. So having a pen test also has a few unexpected benefits. So for example, Let's say that your company wants to create a partnership with a different company or they want to integrate a different platform. Oftentimes, the other company will have you fill out a really long vendor review. And for anyone who's done a vendor review, they're terrible. There are a thousand questions to answer. And what I found frequently is by sending a pen test from a rep reputable pen testing firm is that they'll accept it to answer a lot of the questions to just show the security posture of your organization. And also, you're able to benchmark your overall security health by comparing it from a test to test, from year to year, and hopefully you're trending in an upward direction where upward involves fewer vulnerabilities and more secure code. So data, is the ultimate truth, and here you have hard data and evidence of that. And then also similarly, we have um, a bug bounty program, Augusto. Given that it was just myself at that time, it would not have made sense to use my limited time to do pen testing, even though it's a lot of fun, I really enjoy it. It wasn't the best ROI for my time. So by being able to leverage hundreds of researchers from all across the world to have them constantly probing at our system with hundreds of eyes, hundreds of methodologies, hundreds of perspectives, I have scaled myself through this program to empower the other researchers to poke around and hopefully find vulnerabilities for me. So by being able to do pen testing and this bug program, this is staff augmentation, and this has helped me to keep an eye on code after it has launched and shipped. So I went over the technical strategies, but now I wanna go over some of the cultural ones. These are more nuanced and could be argued Maybe they're even more important than some of the technological things. And I really have prided myself on being able to build a security conscious culture at Gusto. And these are a few of the strategies that I used. So first off, I can't emphasize how important it is to build relationships with different key stakeholders at your company. So. These are a few of the ones for myself at Gusto, and note that other companies, you might have different stakeholders or different groups, but for some of the groups that have worked well for me, um, I'll go through some of them. The first one is IT. You could think of them as frontline security. So oftentimes, they get requests from our employees if they see a weird pop-up in their computer, if the browser's acting funny. These could be security issues, but maybe the employees who report them don't necessarily know that. 
So by having a full IT help desk and support staff ready to keep eyes on anything security related, that in itself, from taking just myself and now empowering the rest of the IT team to look for this, that's been huge. Legal and compliance are also especially relevant given the industry that we're in with uh, PII and PHI. So ensuring that we're compliant with the different laws and regulations. I know that you all have the GDPR here. Um, we have the CCPA coming up in California next year. So you can imagine with your other companies with doing security, how important GDPR is. So being able to work with legal compliance, I would imagine for you all as well is huge. Uh, one group that surprised me how important and powerful they were are the product managers or the PM group. So these are the group of folks who create the features that the engineers are building. So by partnering with the product management team at the very, very beginning, so this is shift left to the extreme, you are working with the PM group to have eyes on anything that may be security related. So for any features that may touch authentication or authorization, by having them keep you in the loop, then you know that you're going to get pretty much full coverage on every feature. And then finally, engineering and infrastructure. I think these two are pretty obvious. The engineers are the ones writing the code. So by being able to partner with them and to get them on your side, that's there's nothing more powerful than that. And then finally, infrastructure. These are the individuals who are building your different networks and systems. And if your network systems aren't secure, then it's already game over. So you want them to be fully on your side. So I think a lot of you have seen this picture, that everything's OK. And I think, speaking from personal experience, that a lot of people in security just think everything's OK, that it is what it is, and there's not much I can do about that. But then I want to tell you that this really is not the case. You should not be trying to hide it. Coming from the development side, getting transparency into what's going on on the security side is so, so important to get the buy-in. So the point here is I want for you all to be authentic with the engineers and non-engineers alike. Share the pen test report with them where it's appropriate, obviously. Share the bug bounty findings. By being able to show them that you're vulnerable and that you're willing to work with them, you are gaining trust with them. And then likewise, you can trust them as well when they have to fix issues or create new tools. And from what I've seen, at least from my experience, others are really willing to help if you want to bring them in and if you want to show them that security does want to help and it's not there just to block, but rather it's to empower. The next thing is be accessible. So be open and be willing to help others. So while it was just myself, on the security team, I made it a point to eat lunch with nearly every single team in some way. So throughout the week, one day it would be legal, the next day it would be marketing, the next day it would be compliance. So by being able to show them that I'm not just off in some corner typing away, that I want to be actually with the company and with the greater population, it built inherent rapport with the different um, coworkers. And then I also want to share another story with you. So there was uh, one individual who had a question with a personal two-factor authentication account. I think they were trying to add some account, but they were having some issue. Again, this 
is not my job responsibility. I'm not IT support. I'm not trying to help them fix their 2FA. Also, this was their personal 2FA. So this was a question of, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to be your personal IT support now. Um, the reason why I share that is I think about a month or two later, there was a pretty critical ask that I needed of this person. So because I already had helped uh, with their initial ask, that I already had built the initial goodwill and had deposited all the, again, goodwill into that account. So security is much like a bank. Once you make with, uh, once you make deposits, there are times that you're going to need withdrawals and you're going to need favors. So why not try to build up the initial goodwill to make the withdrawals as you'd see necessary? And then on a more tactical point for security education, I have seen a lot of success come at Gusto by me being able to give different classes for different things. So one of them is a security specific class for engineering. So I show them a few of the web vulnerabilities, go over different tools in our pipeline, I, uh, let's see, the main purpose of this for me is to not teach them what a SQL injection is. Sure, I give them initial exposure, but by me being able to put a name to the face and then to show that security is a real thing, and then I make myself out there, I make myself visible. So one thing also to note is that by me teaching this class, the ratio of my time invested to output is pretty significant. So with just myself teaching an hour class, for example, I can reach 15 or 20 engineers, however many are joining uh, for that start class. So that's a pretty great time investment for that. And then also uh, I teach a uh, security phishing, or sorry, phishing training class with a follow-up campaign. So we do that every once in a while, and that ensures that security is very top of mind for the different individuals. And again, the point I want to drive home is that by me teaching these classes, it amplifies myself and it makes the greatest return on my time. So now, I want to show you what happens when all of this works right. What happens when you scale yourself successfully? What happens when you consider yourself successful? So in this example here, I have this engineer who reached out to me. This person was just, you know, poking around the system, playing and stumbled across a system that should have been locked down a lot tighter. I think this is not a, an uncommon thing for engineers since they're in the trenches day to day playing with different tools, they see things. So for this engineer to proactively reach out and for us to close this down, that's a pretty huge win. And this person here is not an engineer, but is in a customer facing role. So they receive a ton of emails, incoming emails every single day. And then knowing that the individual here is so security conscious as to not click on the phishing email allows me to sleep so much better at night. And it's not just for this person again, but it's for the others as well who are hyper aware. And if they do have questions, they're willing and not afraid to reach out to me to get a second opinion. And this is also one of my favorite examples. One of my favorite engineers I get a chance to work with. So this engineer here pinged me in the morning at 9.24 a.m. Um, two reports had come in from HackerOne, from our bug bounty, 
with two things that weren't great. And the point here is that the engineer proactively already checked their email, looked through it, triaged it, and even had pull requests ready to go in about an hour after this message. So just think about how cool that actually is, that I don't have to go and bug the different teams. Hey, can you go and fix this? This is an issue. So to have people who are willing to be on your team and on your side, that's so, so powerful, and it makes my job honestly that much easier. So I can focus on things that are not that may be more relevant at a time with a bigger risk, but some of these low-hanging fruit, I already can trust the rest of the company to take care of. So we've gone over a ton of things. And now you've seen a ton of different strategies from a technical perspective, from a cultural perspective. And yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. It's not easy. There's a lot of stuff going on. So to summarize from a technical perspective, um, ABC, always be coding. So my favorite emoji. I was shocked to find that ABC worked out really well. Uh, static code analysis, vulnerable dependency management, pen testing, and using a bug bunny program. So the top three are development and shifting left or pushing left. And then the bottom two are post the deploy. So by being able to have a combination of pre and post, that is a minimal amount of time required for each of these different things with a huge output that's allowed me to scale on the technical side. And from the cultural side, I can't stress enough how important it is to build relationships, to be authentic, to be accessible, and to provide security education. Again, the technical ones were fun as a technical person, but by being able to use these cultural strategies, I've been able to inculcate a culture of security at Gusto. So now this brings me back to one of my first slides. Despite being outnumbered, despite ever-changing priorities, and despite being just an IC without a director or a CISO title, I was able to be incredibly powerful by being able to empower others to deeply care about security. Now, for those of you who may be also a one-person security team, or maybe you're thinking about moving to a new job where you'd be the first, I'm not going to lie to you. It's not easy, and it's going to be a lot of work. But by being able to see the fruits of the efforts that you put in, you are able to build a security culture from the ground up. And that's been incredibly rewarding for me. Now, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this whole presentation, is that solely relying on a director or CISO title to influence is a problem that positional power will not solve. To have true power, you need to have a desire to solve and to understand and to solve challenges with software and with relationships. So thank you so much for listening, and that's my presentation. So here's some uh, contact info for myself. So we'd love to chat some more about this. Um, anything else, I'm open to just talking about different strategies. I think one last thing, I want to thank uh, Ricky and Flea at Gusto. So they were instrumental in helping me create this presentation to edit it. And then for those of you who also, I think you're all in Europe, but if anyone's in the US, we're hiring. So to be able to work with a world-class security team, going to throw Gusto or hiring. So if you're interested, let's chat. Thank you.
question. Thank you. Um, does this work? Yeah. Um, so I actually the first time I've spoke with someone from Hacker One today. It's the first time I heard of the company. I was just asking your opinion of the value of doing that versus like, is, should it sit on top of penetration tests or should you do a side like this instead of? Absolutely. That's a fantastic question. Yep. So one thing that's worked really well for Gusto is to run both pen tests and a bug bite program. So for the pen test, that happens once a year, maybe twice a year, depending on how often you want to run it. But that in itself is an in-depth four-week deep dive where they have source code, have full access to go through your systems. And that in itself is invaluable. You get a report at the end of the engagement. But the thing is, for a bug bounty to combine it where it's an ongoing program, where you have people looking at it through the entire year, not for just this four months, these are similar, but analogous, but tangential into having both a pen test and a bug bounty report or bug bounty program. Does that kind of make sense on why it would make sense to have both, not just one? Okay. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, it seems like you are positioning your role as very supportive, uh, trying to work with the developers and try not to be the bad guy. But I think, um, well, sometimes um, you as a security person are like the paranoid person. Yes. And sometimes I think, oh, here she comes again with <laughs> these, um, she, yeah, she's watching too much, uh, too many uh, 80s movies about Russian evil people. Absolutely. So how do you deal with these kind of uh, potential conflicts or differences in viewpoints about what is a risk and what is not? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there, it is a tricky situation because so there have been times where I have needed to like lay down my foot and say, no, this has to be fixed. So we have to prioritize this, prioritize this as a P0 over different things. But the key thing here is that you've built up this much goodwill to what I initially referred to earlier. So they inherently trust you. When you say that this actually is an issue, they'll believe you it is an issue. And then you aren't pulling the fire alarm for every single thing. You have to balance the risk among the different issues. Some things may have to slide. You might not have time to work on it right now. But if it's a low enough issue, you can let that go and really focus on the important and the big wins. Again, once you're ready to pull a fire alarm, they're going to be at your side ready to assist you because you've built trust with them. Does that make sense? So it's a bit of choose your battles. Yes, yes. Okay. So And then that's worked incredibly well. Again, I would love to fix... I have a whole backlog of issues, things I've seen at Gusto that I would love to fix. But again, for the biggest things for risk for us, I've been able to effectively mitigate those by using my resources and choosing the battles appropriately. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, my question is that we are working on the cloud, so in the cloud because we have one part of the infrastructure and we realize that there's a really big uh, challenge so my question is, um, can you trust the people of the infrastructure? Should I repeat? Should I repeat? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. My question is, if you are working on premise or in the cloud, because you have uh, one part is the infrastructure. And I realize in my company that we have a huge problem between uh, SDLC and cloud security. Yes. And one person, it's really less. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yes, so we are in the cloud uh, solely on AWS. One thing, as we were saying, is that I don't have the time to go through every AMI, go through every EC2 instance, go through every ALB to audit these different things. So this comes down to me trusting the infrastructure team to appropriately handle it. That is a bit terrifying to ha give trust over to someone else. And then occasionally I'll poke in, audit around. But f if we set the proper defaults and by having occasional meetings with <coughs> that infra team, then we get to have a sync where I don't do all the 
manual work, but I can keep up to date of what they're doing. Um, yeah, fully agree. It's a super challenging thing. It's something we're trying to really figure out. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I'll leave it for time. Thanks. Well, it sounds like you did uh, a great job, especially interpersonally, and I know that's like a huge, Thanks. that's a huge struggle and really where a lot of those wins are. Um, so one thing, how would you describe how you approach like the kind of difficult players? I notice in your kind of get everyone on board, mm -hmm. uh, you know, come to those understandings. Uh, for instance, you didn't have a uh, sea level management or the board listed who mm -hmm. are often big people who can be yeah. for you or against you. So I'd be curious to hear about that. Is there a certain group that you're thinking of? Like, you're saying people who are tough, like for C levels or for different coworkers that may not be bought into the idea of security, uh, or just either. E either or, yeah. Whatever mm -hmm. is more relevant for kind of sure, what your sure. experience was. So I'll start with a C level. I was really fortunate um, to partner with our CTO. He's one of the co-founders of the company. So by me actually reporting to him directly, I had. I was in a great position actually to influence and talk about different things, push maybe an agenda that I had or suggest maybe this tool or this pen testing firm. So I know that's kind of a unique situation, but by having one of again the co-founders bought into security, no one's going to argue against the CTO or co-founder. And then for some of the ICs, that actually is a great question. It just took time. I know that some of them were against me trying to maybe restrict their access or to not allow them to iterate as fast. But once they saw their other teammates not being slowed down, they slowly warmed up. Yeah, it's not an easy fight, but it was one that I was willing to have to get these different coworkers and maybe tough IC individuals on board. Nice. So it's like inherent peer pressure, but from their teammates, I guess. Oh. Uh, uh, this will be the last one. We have okay. already run out of time. Um, do you have any tips uh, about um, choosing or managing priorities? Uh, what's more important when you have this uh, uh, little time? That's a great question. Yep. So when it comes down to managing priorities, it all comes down to me at least is what is the biggest risk to the company? And that is a question that's quite broad reaching and which is why it was so important for me to build with chips with the different individuals on different teams. So people on legal think that maybe this one thing is a priority, but this other person on the compliance team thinks it's that. So by being able to correlate and get all this information, I'm able to digest it and also send it back out and ask for different pieces of feedback. And then by being able to have a risk ranking of the different teams, different projects going on, I'm able to put my time maybe towards the top three, for example, and let go of the four and downs. Super difficult, but I think it's worked really well for me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, but that was the okay. time for questions. Awesome. Thank you.